Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. This time I'm looking at some Commodore C16s here. So, hi, yeah, straight away, this is in terrible state. Both of these, absolutely terrible state, these boards. So, we've got a huge blob of solder there going down to the uh, edge of the uh, PCB there. Lots of the components here have been like knocked out of place. I need to make sure there's no bridges, including some of these resistors here. We've got two main chips here missing. I'm guessing one is Ted. I think the other one might be a CPU, I'm not sure which way around those are, I think this might be Ted, the, long, the larger chip here. Uh, we've got a dodgy socket here, the middle's cut out, so uh, something's missing from there, uh, a ROM or a PLA maybe. Uh, that's socketed. What else have we got? Um, power switches on this one, the other board that doesn't have a power switch. That's different to the uh, C64 one, isn't it? It's not the same. The um, Instead of having three rows of pins coming out this way, they're coming out that way, and the switch is the other way. It's like the other orientation. So, uh, yeah, that's interesting. That explains, perhaps, why this one's got the switch and the power thing and everything missing. And uh, the C16, if you're not aware, has got these little uh, mini DIN connectors here. And similarly, on the back here, look, for the uh, tape interface. Uh, you do have the serial connector there, and you've got a video, I forget which one's which there. Um, same as the C64, so you can use disk drives from a C64 or a VIC-20, I think, with this. Um, but it might need an adapter because, obviously, that is powered by the tape uh, port here. And this doesn't have that, so hmm, that's uh, going to be uh, an interesting uh, challenge. So yeah, this is the obvious one to go with because this one's just got so much missing. It's just got so much missing here, some stuff up here as well. Well, that's the switch, isn't it? Something from there, what's that? Uh, oh, power socket, yeah, so it's a DC barrel jack there. It's got a reset button as well, that's nice. Yeah, so uh, I've got a TED, I think. I don't think I've got a CPU for this. You can use, I believe, a uh, 6510 with a modification in one of these, from you know, a CPU from a C64, but you need a, a ROM with a, 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 some sort of update on it, I think. You know, a modified BIOS uh, or kernel, I think. Um, but yeah, I think we'll start with this one. Look at that there, that's the keyboard connector. I'm guessing it's, uh, it looks like the same keyboard connector as the C64 Vic 20, but that's mangled. So I need to straighten some things up. That's where I'll start, I think. I think I'll start by straightening up all things that are bent over, and then have a bit of a thorough inspection of the board. I think we'll get this socket off. Um, let's have a look at that one. Yeah, so the solder points there don't look too bad. There's a few little marks on the traces, but it's not too bad. Yeah, that, though, does need to come off, I think. We'll get a new socket on there. Uh, other solder points don't look too bad on the underside of this one, actually, and it's kind of largely intact. It's missing a port here, though, look, a joystick port. It's missing one of those, so oh, we can borrow one of the ones off this and stick that on there. Uh, it needs a fuse. So, yeah, uh, there might be a chance we can get this one up and running, and it's missing the, uh, the port here as well. Again, we can borrow the port uh, from this one here, I think. So we should be able to get one, hopefully, functional C16 uh, out of these two boards. So I've got the wrist strap on for this. Move these here if I want to be, but really pedantic. But you don't really need it. Um, everything uh, looks okay there, I think. So we'll next move on to removing that socket, I think. So soldering end has heated up here. Let's uh, just come in and the desolder. I'm not using the desolder station. Uh, I just want to use the desolder pump. The reason being is every time I use the desolder station, obviously it blocks up and stuff and it gets dirty. So I prefer to keep it uh, for places where I absolutely need it. This C16 came from Sparks UK by the way, I'm not sure if I already mentioned that or not. And I think he, yeah he did, he provided me a TED. But I think I may have another TED or something somewhere for this, I'm not entirely sure. We do have a PLA that came from Daniel, I think. I'll stick his name top left. Right, so solder point's fairly free there. Let's just uh, have a little look of it here. I may cut this socket into sections here, if that helps. Let's just see. 
there are one or two pads on this side here that are uh, terrible or missing. Missing, I think, actually. One thing I will do is just keep this as a spare because of the double wipe on your dual wipe sockets. So I can use those pins uh, elsewhere to fix other sockets. And I think it is that corner one. There we go, it's coming out. So, yeah, the pads are all okay there. There's a bit of solder there, I can feel it. Uh, anyway, that's that uh, off. Yeah, this side here ain't moving at all. Rock solid. Try and rock it a bit like that. There we go, it's freeing up now. I'm not too bothered if the pins break here and we've got like a pin stuck through because I can just remove that one pin. There we go. Let's come out, look. No through hole or anything. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they look a bit of a state here. Each time you use the desolder station, now I will just uh, point you towards this. It's a Duratool clone, a desolder station. Costs you probably around the £100 mark, you know, and you can just yeah, press the button and uh, suck up the solder. That might be easier than using a manual desolder pump. Yeah, I'm not sure we need braid there. No, those are pretty clean. Well, what we'll do is just go over it with the fiberglass pencil here. And then a little bit of IPA. We've got a bit of wire here, look. It's, yeah, there's a piece of wire there going to a wire. So I need to inspect that with some magnification, I think. Nevertheless, I think it was a good idea to remove that because we've just found that wire. What is that wire doing? It doesn't even look right to me. It looks like it could be bridging uh, some incorrect connections there. Yeah, so whenever you pick up a board in a state like this, be prepared to remove sockets, even if they look really well and soldered up and nice and clean. This one didn't. Um, but that could be the source of the problem. You know, someone else has worked on this previously, uh, perhaps before it went to Sparks UK, and he's just used it for spares, I think. So I now need to just inspect, maybe use a little bit of flux and braid on any pads that look questionable here. Um, hold it up to the light, look through, make sure you can see through all the holes. Uh, work out if there's any damage, but also, it's inspect this here, can you see that? There is a trace here. Yeah, and looking on macro, can you see? There's supposed to be a fix here, I think this was to fix this. I would do this on the underside, and look what it's doing, it's, it's looped onto here. Yeah, and it almost looks bare. That can't be good. I suspect this pin may have been joined to that pin, but it does just want to go up there, so I'm going to do that on the underside. Um, yeah, the other pads there look alright. They're a bit questionable though. This is where I will use a dowel tool like this, and any that aren't spherical, just push it, twist it, be careful not to pull, uh, you know, the through hole out, etc. Uh, yeah, so a few of those just need uh, rounding a little bit. Uh, that trace needs uh, fixing up on the underside when we get the socket on, I think. But the underside is worse for wear here, there's the other pad missing I think. So I need to make sure that the uh, solder flows through and does join on the other side. So I need to uh, work out you know, the opposing pin on the opposite side here, wherever these pads are missing. Looks like there's one missing there, I can't tell. And uh, just see where that trace on the other side goes to, make a note on a diagram or something, so that I can test connectivity from here once I add some solder to see is it going where it should go. Um, that is the uh, thing I need to do there. And the other thing I just spotted near the uh, missing tape connector here is R12 is missing and R102. So uh, yeah, I need to get those as well. I think I'll just fit those now, I'll pull those off the other board. So the first of those resistors is here. This one's the nearest the edge of the PCB. It's interesting those have been removed off the board we're working on here. Quite why? I don't know. You know, you've got a question, what's happened to this? Or what's happened to another one where someone's had to borrow the two resistors from it? Maybe it's a common fault. Anyway, that's the first one. So this one is the inner one, which I'm not sure is the same size as the other one actually. But anyway, that's the inner one. Start with that one. So just pushing that resistor up from the uh, underside there. So if it goes a bit blurry while I do this, and um, we'll just get some uh, solder onto that point there. And we go. Just let go now. Solder onto there. We'll just trim that leg down a bit, it's a bit long. Give it a, a bit of a reflow, same on that side. A little bit of a reflow. And just flipping it over, you can see that doesn't look too bad, that bottom one. So I think we'll just trim one or two of the pins down that are next to that as well, so these are slightly elongated. Yeah, 
Yeah, so that's not too bad. It is a kind of a little bit squished. Let's just straighten it. There we go. Somewhat. Move that one over a bit. And flipping it back over that way, again, we'll just trim the slight excess off there. And I think we'll clean up as we go along. Yeah, that's not too bad. And they're looking good from this side as well. So I did just make all of these spherical on both sides because there were loads of them were squished on both sides. Hopefully you can see they're a lot better. The uh, There was that wire, I pulled it through here so that it's, I'll show you on the other side it's taut. I'm just being very gentle here now. Just having a bit of a clean up. I'm not going to go overboard because I'm going to be toothbrushing this in a minute anyway. Yeah, that wire there, it's just pulled straight up through the hole and straight out the other side. So it's not interfering with the pin next to it now. And it will be uh, hidden away, you know, the sockets. Once the socket's on there, you won't know that is damaged. I'll just measure to that uh, wire there after I've fitted the socket, just to make sure it's okay. But anyway, we cleaned around there before, didn't we? It's not like I need to go crazy clean in here. Uh, so we've just got one uh, pin there to unblock, and then we can get a socket on, I think. Because the pad on the opposite side is a bit mangled, I'm just going to heat from this side. We'll unblock it here and then use the uh, dowel, I think, there we go, nice that. So our pin one notch is to the uh, right side of the board there. And we just need to get the, the notch there corresponding with that, make sure the pins are straight. And carefully slide that into position, I think. Yeah, that's the way they work with the dowel, really helps. And all the pins are going through perfectly there, so we can just uh, hold it. Flip it, solder a couple of pins, then inspect to make sure it's nice and straight. I'll solder the point with the wire um, as one of the final ones actually. Just want to get it in position to start with. Just pressing it. So that's two points anchored. Yeah, and as you can see that's going to be nice and straight and it's round the right way. So I'll just commit to soldering the remaining points. So again, I'll just clean up as I go along here. Noel's retro lab uh, job here of uh, doing that to mop it up. What we'll do later is just put the, uh, you know, use the larger brush and brush the mic here, the whole thing, clean the whole thing. So I've got a test on connectivity, meet probes together. And it's this wire above it. And we've got a join. Pin next to it, no join. Some resistance to the one on the other side, no join. So I think the next thing I'll do is just straighten up these. Let's go down the profile uh, this way. Right, so I completely forgot to check on the fuse size. I'll uh, check that in a second, unless it's on the schematics. This first page here in the service manual, really nice actually, really useful service manual, because it's got the pinouts, CPU 7501. So yeah, I have recollections of having an adapter somewhere from a 6510 to this, because you can, like I say, with a custom ROM, I think, make it pretty much compatible. Uh, yeah, ROM uh, pinouts here as well. Ted is the large uh, pin count and dip chip there. I think I've got one of those, I think Sparks UK provided that. But I think one of my patrons may have provided one of these at some point in the past as well, so I may have two. So I'm not really sure what goes in this position here, because it's like ROM ROM. What's this? PLA maybe? I don't know. Um, I will study these further and report back. We've got two RAMs here, U5, U6, I think. Um, which would be these, yeah, U5, U6, so one of those has been swapped. We might need to remove that socket yet, uh, I don't, honestly do not know. You can do 64K mod, might do to, that as a separate video following this. It's dead simple, it's like stick a different chip in there, I think, or two different chips in there, and then you just uh, wire a couple of wires on there, and it's 64K, as far as I understand. Um, 16K, I think, isn't it? This? Right, so the fuse is 1.5 amp uh, normal blow. Um, so I think before I fit the fuse, I'm just going to use the uh, fiberglass pen on the uh, contacts here. And U16, incidentally, is a PLA. So that's good news. It means I'll have to go and find or program a ROM because I have um, some PLAs here. Uh, so I'll get the fuse in there. You have to push these fuses slightly to the side in order. There we go. 
get it to clip in nicely so it's got a fuse. So I showed this on the uh, update 5 video actually uh, about moving into this new workspace here. It came from this amazing guy here, Daniel Mantion. Brilliant guy. Uh, he created the PLA uh, mods to start with I think and he sells them on Buy My Retro I think it is. I'm not sure I pronounced that right, Mantion. Um, yeah, so amazing. Five PLA 20 V8 kits, two PLA 16 V8 kits. So one of these is for the TED. Uh, and some DIY cartridges here, which you'll see in an upcoming video as well. There'll be a few videos related to these donations from Daniel. So yeah, you go, Commodore TED PLA. So it's a kit comprising of a PLA. You know, it's probably a Gal, Gal 16 V8. So we'll open that, we'll build one of those up. There are instructions here for the uh, PLA that assists TED here. So you can see what it's going to look like. Yeah, there are a few things, a few resistors and caps and things, I think, to go on there. Um, so, yeah, it might take me a few minutes to build this, but, yeah, that's really nice. Now, an obvious retrospect thing is if I'd researched what this was, U16, before fitting that socket, I would have fitted a turn pin socket. Because this is going to have turn pins going in there, which means it's going to widen the connections there. It doesn't really matter because it's probably going to outlive the rest of the system. And it will stay pretty firm. It's going to be pretty tight pushing it in there. It'll stay in there. So I don't think there's anything lost by doing that. But, yeah, my recommendation to you is if you're replacing the PLA socket and you're putting a modern PLA on there, put turn pins, it just makes it a bit easier. So you can see we've got the two PCBs here, this is nice, can make two of these up. Um, or is it two PCBs? I'm getting confused. Yes it is, so I'm going to have to cut these, aren't I? But we've got everything we need here, we've got some sockets, we've got some diodes there, uh, some resistors, it's not going to take too long this actually, and then a couple of uh, programmed, pre-programmed uh, gals there. Not sure if it's focusing very well on this light. Yeah, so it is scored in the middle. I don't know whether you can see there is a line here. And what I'm just going to do is just score it further. So I'll get the craft knife here, get it dead into the middle, hang on. And then I'm going to slowly drag across this. I've been careful not to slide off onto my ESD mark. Again, just make sure I'm in it. There you go. And do a little bit of sawing maybe, like that. and I'm using soaring, soaring in the loosest term there, it's not really soaring, but you know what I mean. Forwards, backwards motion. That's it, so we've scored it a few more times there, and we'll do the same thing on this side if we can find it. There we go. So, let's now see if we can separate these, can we break them? And pre There you go, can you see it giving way in the middle? Forwards, backwards, there we go, lovely. So yeah, that wasn't uh, too much of uh, a stressful event. So we'll just separate these two sockets, if we can, without bending all the pins. Yeah, so I'm assuming, and this is the thing, <laughs> assumptions can be a problem. You can make mistakes, but anyway, I'm going to assume that the socket goes here like this. Yeah, and then we've got some uh, diodes, I think, or resistors that go around the outside. So those are going to be easy to solder. So we'll get this socket on first and then the strips of uh, pin header which are going to come up from the underside here I think and we're going to be soldering on the top side again there's nothing in the way so I'd finish off with these little components on the outside so uh, let's do that, make sure pin one's right, yeah pin one's to the left I think the CPU adapter I've got is pre-assembled, thank goodness I really don't want to have to assemble that as well hang on a minute, what's going on here? Yeah, one of the pins is bent there. Can you see that? It just happens to be the pin that was soldering. What are the blooming odds? Let's just stick something under that so I don't melt them out. Let's just unblock that. That's not a good start, this, is it? Yeah, hole is unblocked. Pin is bent. Now, this is useful to show you. You can see what's happened here. It's sticking out the end. Yeah. So, uh, what I'll do with this is actually pull it. You know, turn it upside down like that. Grab the pin. Just pull straight upwards a little bit, repeat, just make sure it's pulled up as far as it can go. Inspect, make sure they're all level, and they are. And we'll try again. So pin one to the left. The nice thing with that is, if, imagine if I hadn't soldered on the pin that was the one that wasn't through. I could have got all the way to the end and gone, oh my god, one of the pins isn't through. And uh, yeah, that would be a problem. I mean, technically you could pull it out from the top side and just push it back in. Uh, but it was folded, wasn't it? So it could have been folded underneath the socket and it may not have uh, come out easily. Yeah, 
there we go, it needs a clean but uh, that's the first uh, part done. So it's, yeah quite a lot of this because it's for all the other mods that he's provided as well so that's very nice of him. Uh, yeah we just need to cut two strips of this, the fat part here can you see, it's fatter on one side, wants to go at the point where you solder. So it's going to go up that way up, you know, and the thin pins go into the socket. So we'll just uh, line that up and cut that at that point there, I think. Be careful not to lose my position as I do that. That's one. Yeah, so I've got some turn pin sockets here. Let's just uh, put these into that, like that. Probably the easy way of doing this, I usually show it the other way around, like trying to line them up and push them in. It's easier just to push them in like that and then plop your PCB on top, oh yeah, and just solder it. And there we go, jump cut to having uh, soldered all the points there. Just need to try and separate these two now, so I'm just going to just uh, weave it upwards like that. Careful on each side, try and get near to the middle as possible. Uh, I think what I might do actually is just use these uh, pliers here and just prise outwards like that. It's just like a controlled way instead of it going woo, you know, like completely over and bending all the pins. There we go. So that's all our pins nice and straight. So the final there's little components now, a couple of resistors and diodes I think. All diodes and one resistor. The one resistor goes up there. The diodes, I don't know whether you can see from there, but there's like a thicker white side to these, that's the cathode. Can you see the black band? The black band is the cathode. And there we go, all fully assembled. So let's just uh, move all these things out of the way and bring uh, this in here. But yeah, wrist strap is on. We've got the uh, gal here. Pin one is on the left hand side here. And pin one on the socket is here. Now I'm guessing the pin one on the actual adapter is the same up here. I would hope so, because there's no marking on it unless it's on the underside. No, there's no marking there, so we we'll just carefully push that into position. Yeah, that's it. So yeah, I think that pin one is up here. Uh, again, my wrist strap is on. So yeah, I would assume that pin one's to the left here, I would assume it goes this way. You know what they say about assumptions, I might just go and look for footage of this or a picture or something online, because it's not covered in the guide. And this is where you need to push pretty hard probably because, there we go, it's a dual wipe socket. That's it, it's in there, it's nice and flat and flush on all sides. So at least that's that done. So of course the other things we need to do, and you could argue, remove that, measure voltages. Um, because there are some regulators here, yeah, as I thought, a 7805 and a 7... I'm not sure if that's a transistor, it's a transistor that, tip 29. Um, yeah, so I'm guessing, you, and I'll check this, you've V12 volts in here, we can connect the bench power supply for that perhaps. Um, but yeah, my point is, remove things like this and then measure voltage, the same with your TED and your uh, CPU, uh, perhaps if it's an unknown board remove them before you uh, power it on. The TEDs die for fun on these, and the CPUs as well, it's all about temperature, I think they overheat and die. So we'll get some heat sinks on uh, whatever we fit in here. So beyond uh, just uh, pressing that down, I don't know why it's not level on this side. I may just take that out in a minute. It could be the socket's not flat. Yeah, it, I think it's the socket, and it's possibly not flat on this side, maybe. Um, that might come off yet anyway, but we do need a CPU and a TED. Right, by some miracle, in the chaos of moving into this area, I did most find what I think is a TED that looks like it says plus four. And it's pretty big, so that's got to be a TED. And then I found this from myretrostore.co.uk. It's uh, an adapter for C16 CPU 8501, I think 7501 is the earlier one, to 6510. Uh, yeah, and you have a, a jumper to solder there or something, I'm not really sure. I think that's maybe where the custom kernel or whatever, it might be kickstart, not kickstart, BIOS or basic is the word I was looking for, I'll get there the third time lucky. Um, yeah, so this is going to adapt here, but we obviously need a socket and need some turn, <laughs> turn pin strips again down, so I've got to go and assemble this one now. So I think we should buy the magic of editing 
I'll probably just like click my fingers or something part way, solder your turn pins on first and then solder the socket on top. The socket will seesaw on the inner uh, strip there, so yeah, I've had to you know make sure it's try and get it as straight as possible. You could uh, cut the pins down on that inner row there, just so it doesn't interfere with the socket. But anyway, that's it. So obviously we've got that pad down here. We may need to solder a wire or a wire link that. I'm not sure, but it relates to the um, tape motor. So right now I'm not too worried about that. We need to get a 6510 CPU in there. That's a CPU from a C64. Um, but anyway, we can uh, sort of fit that in there. So I was trying to make sense of the uh, DC uh, barrel jack there without any guides or anything. Um, I could have looked online, but I figured, uh, yeah, let's measure from the centre pin to the shield here. Yeah, and it's a dead short, so it's centre pin negative. Yep, yeah, centre pin negative, which means the outer, let's just test which one of these here is the outer. If we go through the centre pin to there, we've got dead short. So that's not connected, it's this side here. So this side here is the positive, yeah? It's the outer on the barrel jack is positive. So if we flip this over, it's the bottom side of the um, choke here that's nearest us this connection here. Uh, I can't that's on or off, let's just put that there. So yeah, so it's the bottom side of this choke here. And if we test it here, nothing. Switch it on, test from there again. Got to join. Yeah, because this is the input to the 7805. So I'm guessing it's 12 volts DC in. Yeah, sensor negative, and the positive comes through to this regulator here. Does it go there as well? No, that's a transistor, isn't it? That goes to the sensor pin there on that tip 29. Um, I'm guessing that's for the tape port. It might not be, uh, but there is there was a, C a transistor like that on a C64 for that purpose. So yeah, it's sensor negative. And we need 12 volts, so I'm just going to uh, solder. I don't know, I might just go and get a DC barrel jack actually and use my uh, Agilent power supply to current limit this. So I've got the connections from the Agilent power supply here into a DC barrel uh, plug. Uh, if we just uh, test, that should be ground. Yeah, make sure it's not short there, it isn't. And this should be the 5 volts. So on that uh, regulator over there, not 5 volts, into the 5 volt regular, it's the positive 12 volts. Yeah, we've got a joint on the uh, pin 1 of the 7805. So, I think what I'll do is I'll set the current limiting to uh, half an amp. So using Ian Scott Johnston's bench power supply here, we're on the 5 volt or 6 volt rail, which is these connections here. I was going to say, because this is 6 volt max, we need to go onto one of these ranges over here. We need to go into a ground there, a positive there, and we need to go onto the 25 volt rail. So let's just do uh, display. Yeah, do check your voltage just before you accidentally switch this on. So we're going to go 12 volts, 12 volts, set the current at a couple of hundred milliamp there. And if we choose uh, output on and display, it's dropped to, hang on a minute. Yeah, the voltage is dropping there. Can you see that? It's gone to its constant current look, 0 0.4. So maybe there's a short on here somewhere. I don't know. I mean, nothing's warm here, but I've limited it here to 200 milliamps. The interesting thing it was showing more than 200 milliamps, wasn't it? Right, so the voltage was uh, dropping down there. I um, changed the output to 9 volts, it's not supposed to be 12, 9 and 1 amp. And if I switch the output uh, on, you can see we've got just under 9 volts, drawing 416 milliamps. I could measure pin 3 on the uh, 7805 there, but if I measure this pin on the top, that chip there, that's 5 volts on the 74 series, 4.94. So the 5 volts is there. But uh, let me just power this off. Another inspection around the board here, there's a diode missing here, and actually one down there. So I think there may be two diodes missing here. That's lukewarm, only slightly warm. So uh, yeah, I think if we have a look at this board, let's just uh, see. Yeah, there's a diode missing there again. So maybe this is a common thing. I think one of them is a Zener, isn't it? Like 6.8 volts or something. But the diode down there is there. So let's fit this one on there. And I'll look up D12 in the schematics and see if I can work out what that is. Right, let's strip on. Let's try and power this up. So we'll get the uh, 6510 into here. This is from one of my C64s. and carefully push it in. Could argue easiest way to do is push this into the board first and then put the CPU in. So CPU's here, pin 1 is on that side. Power is off at the moment. 
sorry, this socket is going to fit, uh, this adapter is going to fit in this socket permanently. There we go. So that's the CPU in. I'm just going to just switch it on at that point now at its head and just check the voltage. And I'll show you this as I do it if we switch it on. 9 volts, 600 milliamps. Yeah, let's just change the current limit here because that's a bit low. Let's put it to 800. Switch it on again. Yeah, so 9 volts, 0 0.6. I've got a video cable connected, you can't quite see uh, there. Let's now switch it off again and get that in. The diode, I'm still waiting for a diode. Um, D12, I think it is. This is Zener, 6.8 volts. I think it's for the tape port, actually. Alright, let's get the uh, TED out. It's an 8360. Uh, Pins are fairly straight on there, it's just a wee bit bent. And that one, that's why it's been leaving out, isn't it, on that side? Mm, that's not too bad. Uh, pin 1 is down here, whatever you do, make sure you've got a wrist strap on with a handle and tear and make sure you get pin 1 right. And obviously make sure you've not got power on. So let's carefully get that into position and push it in. So Ted is now in. I'm going to switch the power on but I'm just going to be feeling Ted. Who, uh, uh, here we go. Oh, we've got a display. Pointing you up at the screen again, just uh, feeling Ted. Who were, uh, and as you can see, it's spooting, isn't it? Not correctly. We've obviously got some problem there, perhaps with RAM or one of the ROMs. But preliminary signs are it's uh, at least booted up. The colour's a bit variable there, let's say it's flickering in there, but. That could actually be a clue because you can see it's going yellow, white, yellow, white, yellow, white. So yeah, maybe the call signal somewhere is being messed up here. So it dawned on me while I was uh, switching this on there, I should show you the uh, other power switch. And then you can see what I mean. Can you see we've got three rows of contacts in that orientation instead of three that way? And obviously, you know, the toggle is like left, right instead of up, down. So it's like, it's really interesting. It's the same sort of thing. You could actually modify this, actually, looking at this now. The, the the thing here would need some serious thought because obviously it's not coming out on the right side there but you could very very carefully strain these out and bend them the other way but you would need to be careful not to stress the uh, plastic you know the part joins the plastic but that i reckon could be modified to fit in uh, place of that as you can see i've got a c64 led here it just uh, helps me uh, realize when it's actually powered on now the interesting thing is a spot can you see this cursor up here let me just get rid of that uh, on-screen display Flashing cursor, um, switch it off, switch it on. Oh, that blooming on screen display. The other thing is, this TV sometimes gets scrunched up at the top, so just ignore that. But we are getting a flashing cursor. So, I don't know, maybe it's a TED problem with video RAM. Well, I said video RAM, I'm not sure this has dedicated video RAM. Um, let me check the schematics, maybe there is dedicated video around. But yeah, this flashy cursor here makes me think it's booted, but there's some, mind you, the cursor shouldn't be up here. I think there should be some text there. So uh, anyway, at least I've got something to go on, at least it is doing something. Something is better than a black screen for sure. I tested that diode before installing it, by the way, in diode test on my multimeter. You can just about see here. Um, and this is a good place to clip your logic probe. It's five volts that I've measured that. So yeah, it's a nice, quick, easy, convenient way. There's little for it to short on around here. Um, I mean, technically you're a bit close to this as long as you've got you know housing around there. It's a good place to clip the five volts on. And the obvious place for the ground is just on the shield here because that is uh, grounded. So it's blooming freezing in here at the moment. It really is. I uh, I need to sort that out anyway. If I switch this on, hang on, yeah, you can't see the screen, but we've got the garbage up. Using the logic probe here on the two five seven. Um, now uh, this pin here is VCC. The next one is the output enable. It's low, yeah. And the next one is uh, one of the four. I think it's four A. I think you've got four A, four B, and then four Y. Uh, now if you look at these ones here, uh, it's telling. This pin here is high. So one of the inputs is high, I think. The other one's pulsing, and the output is pulsing. So that's kind of normal if it's selecting on the, the second uh, input there, I think, instead of the uh, the high. 
yeah but then if we look at its select pin it's pulsing so this shows I think that the 257 here is balked all of the other uh, pins around it we see correct activity so it's just that one then imagine it's an input isn't it it's a I guess what I need to do really is look at it on the uh, logic analyzer to see at the point when it's flipped to the input that's high, does it pass a high? But you see, when you're toggling between a high and a pulsing, you're going to see pulsing, so yeah, yeah, so that might not be the issue. Alright, so a few minutes later, connecting the keyboard up, just press return and shift run stop and stuff, just see if anything happens and it doesn't, it doesn't change any behavior at all. Um, I noticed there's a, a Moss branded chip here, I'll show you in a minute. Um, and that's another 257, there's two of these on the uh, address lines for the RAM there and uh, yeah this one, uh, sorry going back to that pin, the one that was stuck high, there's nothing wrong with that that's actually, well unless there's a fault or short, it goes to the 5 volt rail, it goes to the corner bottom pin on the two RAM chips here so uh, yeah I think that's okay, but we've got the same sort of thing on this one but on the gate here, let me show you the pin one I think is the select isn't it, that's pulsing yeah, the next pin is input, uh, sorry the next pin I think is uh, perhaps either an output or an input, but look, it's high. So we've got stuck high there, and it's just to make sure that doesn't go to 5 volts. Pulsing only there predominantly, I think. And that's kind of like stuck high. I actually think maybe this chip could be the issue. Don't know, anyway, let me just check, make sure that pin is uh, not going straight to 5 volts. I'm thinking it's not being basic actually, I've just took the, what I think is the basic ROM out you can see we have got the screen up and there's a lot less garbage on it. Still the flashing cursor, that I mean, on screen display really gets in my way on this, it's always appearing when you power cycle it. Um, so yeah that's interesting, it makes me wonder about chip selects for the basic maybe. I might just check that next. So the chips like for the uh, basic, it uh, pulses and then when it crashes, you know, you get that screen of garbage and the flashing cursor. It's then uh, high, so it's not selected. Um, so there's obviously no problem actually selecting it for a period of time. It could be being selected at the wrong time, but then we get inconsistent behaviour, aren't we? In terms of the flashing cursor and stuff, which makes me think it's getting so far. I think the next thing I'm going to do is remove this RAM because it'd be nice to have this socket, I'm going to reflow the points on there because they don't look so clever. I want to upgrade the RAM on this anyway, that might be the uh, next video, I don't know. Um, we may end up doing it in this video, so I'm just going to add a little bit of solder and flux to each of the points here just to expedite removal. So I got the RAM off there, I used a bit of uh, braid actually just down this side on top just to remove the excess bit of solder that wasn't coming off with the solder pump so let's just clean around that and get a socket on right socket is on uh, pin one towards the left I've uh, cleaned up the legs on the chip there straightened them up and uh, removed the braid and stuff um, so let's just remove that chip that chip into that socket. That's it. And put this chip, pin one to the left, into this socket. And let's see if there's any difference in the behaviour there. It's doing exactly the same thing though. We're seeing the same behaviour, the same P's in the same positions. And that's going to be a clue, probably. Well, possibly. But yeah, it's exactly the same. So it does not appear to be the RAM, I don't think. I think that's a pretty safe assumption at this stage. So before swapping either of the MOS chips there, I thought let's see if there's a diagnostics ROM. Uh, there is, I'll post a link down below, I'll show you that here you can see it on the web page, it does uh, you know, comprehensive testing of things like the uh, basic ROM and the RAM and backbone of the system etc. So that is a really handy thing to have for any system. So yeah, it could just save you a lot of time and it could save me a lot of time messing around swapping chips on this blindly. At the moment I don't really see anything uh, other than some slightly weird levels on the logic, uh, you know, on the scope, not the logic on this. So anyway, I've programmed the chip there and that's the point where I think it's failing in the test. Can you see there's like two flashes? One, two. One, two. And if I reset it, you'll see that it goes through what I think are normal stages of the test in there. It kind of looks like it's doing something and then it, we get stuck here. 
So I'm just wondering if that two flashes indicates maybe a, a date a bit, uh, could indicate something on the RAM. It could indicate a specific error, the flashes, you know, two flashes like, I don't know. So I'm going to go and have a look at the documentation for that just to see if, we can, if that's given us any clues. Yeah, I've looked at the documentation there. The strange thing with this is this checkerboard here. It does give you a clue as to which RAM location may be an issue. Uh, and you're looking for irregularities. Now there are some when it flashes, but not when it flashes. So it's like it's like the RAM looks all right, and then suddenly it's not. And it's always different locations. So I don't really know what to make of this. It isn't really helping me. You know, if we had, I don't know, a regular pattern somewhere here when it wasn't flashing, then yeah, I could make sense of it, but why only when it flashes? See, what I'm thinking is, I'm thinking because of the sporadic uh, behaviour there where it's like, you know, you see blocks in different places that are wrong, just for a second. Um, maybe the 257s. Certainly the Moss one, one of them is a Moss branded one. But you see the scope, it looks alright. So I didn't cover programming that chip, it's just a 27C128, you know it's like, I don't know, a pound for a chip like that. It's got a window on it, you can erase it with uh, ultraviolet light. And I just programmed up using the TL866 Mini Pro here, it took two minutes to program. So even though I scoped these and I couldn't really see a problem, maybe I missed something on the, the Moss branded one. So I do think I should swap them, or certainly swap the Moss one first. Um, but it's much like the C64 here where they used on the address lines for the uh, the DRAM. Yeah, you've got your two DRAMs there, U5 and U6. And there are two of these, just like there are on the C64. Uh, and it's quite a common fault on the C64. Uh, and also on the C64, Commodore were known to use their own branded ones again. So again, easy to remove, uneventful. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad I followed my hunch there. I can show you what the logic levels look like on that in a minute. I mean, I, I assume it's working. It's waiting for a keyboard test, though, isn't it? I've not got the um, harnesses and things connected. Same with the joystick, so let's just uh, switch that off. It's going to report that was bad. But just trying that with a brand new 257. And uh, it failed around here, didn't it? Look, it's past it. And then you get that. And then you get this. Some colour uh, screens there. So yeah, I'm very pleased. So obviously the only thing we don't know about yet is the actual kernel. But I'm guessing the kernel's going to be alright. So yeah, I'm very pleased. Very chuffed. My first C16 repair. And it's been uh, pretty uneventful really. It was just uh, that one MOS chip. I mean, bear in mind it came to me without CPU. So I've covered in this video the PLA replacement CPU adapter for a 6510. And there will be a video following up on this, on upgrading the RAM, but you've probably seen it before. Ooh, Sam as well. Sweet. Hey! So, I guess the next thing I could do with this now is if I can power the uh, SD to IEC, because it uses a tape connection to power it. There's a sample there. That's really cool. Rob Clark's done a great job on that BIOS, hasn't he? Really, really good. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, what I was saying is if I could power the SD to IEC, I can connect a keyboard up. Uh, I guess that's the next thing to do, really, is get BASIC in, connect keyboard up, see what, whether the keyboard's working in uh, BASIC, and uh, maybe try and load a game from the SD to IEC. Because uh, it has got a normal... Uh, mind you, you can't use the SD to IEC, can you? Yes, you can. What I'm thinking, it's got a standard... It uses a serial port, doesn't it, this, the SD to IEC? Connects via the tape interface to power it, but then it's got a serial connector. So, uh, yeah, let, let, let's just give that a go. Yeah, so that's that MOS chip. It's got on there 7708, I think. Uh, these are renowned for failing. So, yeah, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that that uh, was a problem. There is another one on here, as you can see. I really should replace that. Its equivalent is a 74LS02. And obviously this one was, uh, you know, a 74LS257. Coming back to the TL866 again, you could actually use a device like that to test uh, a logic chip. Uh, you can choose the chip type as a 74LS257, put that in there, and I'm sure that would come up as bad, because that obviously is the faulty part. So the borked chip is in. I'll show you what's going on in terms of the diagram in a minute. And uh, if I just probe this, so I'll start with pin 1. That's pin 1. 
pin 2, pin 3. Yeah, see, look at the level there. And then it seems to straighten up. This is the weird thing with this. So, I don't know. There's something weird going on there. 4. So, yeah, maybe that's the clue. 5, 6. Again, that looks weird. 7. That looks alright. 8. 9. Looks alright. 10. Looks okay. 11. Looks okay. 12. 13. 14. Looks alright. 15. Nothing there. 16. Is VCC. So, yeah, I think the clue is. Let me just go pin 3, wasn't it? No, this cell looks alright now. As it warms up, it starts to behave a little bit differently. I don't know, maybe there is a clue there. The problem is, I'm not looking at the. Oh, there you go, look at that one. That's the thing, that is the problem. So, yeah, if I now take that chip out, before I do that, I'll show you how it's behaving. Yes, yeah, so that's with the diagnostics ROM. If I put the good chip back in and we switch it on, yeah, diagnostics ROM is now booting. So let's see what happens this time. Now, bear in mind the diagnostics ROM may be hitting these pins at different times in a different way. So yeah, that's one, two, three. It's just that's straight away okay. That wasn't before. Pin three was a bit variable. It warmed up okay after a few minutes. Um, when I went back to check, it was okay. But this is the one that again was bored, plug looks normal. So there you go. So the clue was actually there on the scope. I don't know how I missed it. I think at the time I may have convinced myself I had a bad ground because after pressing quite hard on the pin the signal straightened up just as you saw it straighten up a minute ago. So there you go. That's just me down myself at the time I think. So yeah, if you've got a scope uh, you want to look for crazy signals like we saw on pin 3 I think it was and uh, 4, 5, 6, I think 7 or 8 wasn't it? Yeah, and those are fine on here so there we go, and obviously you can hear it in the background. Right, it is precariously hanging over the bench here. Right, let's switch that off. Uh, I'm so pleased, I really am. The nice thing is as well, is I've got a, um, a test ROM here, so I'm going to label this up. I think I'll just keep this as a C16 test ROM. The way that Rob Clark's uh, compiled those, there's two different ones, well, four different ones, there's PAL and NTSC variants of this test ROM. And there's one for the low ROM. Um, for cartridges and one for kernel replacement so let's put that on the mat let's get I should have the wrist strap on here I haven't got it on just now let's get that back in and just see if basic boots up hang on let's just spell a that because you can use you know like I'm using here one C64 keyboard on uh, all three uh, systems so let's just type uh, gadget hang on a minute is there a key stuck down or something here that says read directory so there's some of the problem here. Yeah, the keyboard ain't working. So we have another problem. I'm assuming you can use a C64 keyboard. I could be talking rubbish. This is like proof that you can't. I don't know. It's strange that, isn't it? So, um, I think I need to go check the schematics. I'm just wondering, there's a little IC down by the um, let me show you, it's just down by the keyboard cable, I'm hoping it ain't that because I've just got this terrible feeling it is and it's a little custom. Yeah, hopefully it ain't that little IC there because it's a bit suspicious isn't it, it's here. When I first saw it I thought oh, I'll be a clock gen chip that, but then I'm not so sure now you know, because it is right next to this here. So it would not surprise me if that little IC there is balked actually. I mean of course it could be TED, I've got a different TED in here now, I've not got the one Sparks UK so I've got another one. Let's just swap back to Sparks and let's just switch that off. Yeah, let's just get the other TED out here, so this is the one Sparks UK so That one I've just used there is uh, an R2. Pin 1 is down this side here. Again, single white sockets, so it could be just a bad connection, maybe. Right, that's Ted in. Switch it on again. Let's just see if the keyboard does anything different. No, as soon as you press A, it comes up to directory. 
so hmm. that's the IC there, I've got the keyboard connector here the only two control signals is the read write which obviously goes to the CPU um, I can check that that goes to the CPU and we've got this uh, here, the uh, key uh, port chip select I think and that comes from uh, another page on the schematic, I'll show you that in a second but beyond that all you've got is the data bus connections on one side of that chip and the keyboard matrix on the other so yeah it's got to be so I've ruled out TED by swapping TED but one thing I haven't done is check these connections between TED and uh, the keyboard matrix there so it's like it's scanned um, using TED and that small chip so that small chip is kind of like uh, a reduced version of the CAA you know because there was a port on the CAA that would uh, do that so they've taken like the probably the single port from that and stuck it into this diddy little chip here it's uh, quite a nice idea but you've got to question would it have not been more cost effective to just stick a CAA on that I don't know maybe CAA would be more expensive it's a larger chip the board is pretty small and optimal as it is so I guess it, it perhaps made sense to just make a smaller smaller chip just with that one port in there perhaps so it's a 20 pin device pin 19 um, you know the same from the end here is the chip select now this needs a little bit of further investigation I think hang on I slipped off it then so if we uh, probe that you can see it's pulsing now a minute ago its frequency seemed to change there were like gaps in between the pulse in there which did make me wonder if there was a problem with this the fact you hardly ever see the uh, green there is it uh, does it need a pull down or is it is it a case of the logic levels wrong so I'm going to scope that actually, just to make sure that that chip select is not looking really weird I think I may have shorted the supply out there using a clip here let's just see if there's a better ground is this grounded yeah it is so we could use uh, that heatsink there it's really easy to accidentally blooming short pins here. I'm not seeing anything on that chip select now. So I'm checking the address connections on the PLA here. And I'll show you why. I scoped that and um, whilst it was flashing high on Logic Pro, there's literally nothing on the scope. It's just like stuck high. There's no activity. So the chip select might be the problem on that rather than the actual chip. So anyway, I checked uh, the uh, lower address bits on this and I'm up to the uh, other side of the PLA here. Did the ones down here is like pin 2 up towards pin 9 I think and then pin sorry pin 8 and then pin 9 and 10 join. Those are correct. And then it continues on with the address lines on the other side. So the one I was up to there, uh, if I just do 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So 21 is one of the address lines and somewhere here I think you know where it is now yeah 21's there then on to 22 yeah and we go around the CPU I think this is A11 if memory serves we have no join to the CPU on A11 and that probably might well may coincide with the address uh, selection you know the address range for the keyboard chip selector. It wouldn't surprise me if that was the issue. Um, and that might be why we're seeing high on the, the, the logic, uh, on the scope. What is strange though is like this is the high pulsing on the probe. I don't know, I can't explain that. That's a bit weird. It's like the probe's oscillating or something. It's, but there isn't high impedance signal or something. That's just very strange. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is compare to the balked board, uh, this one here. And just see if I can, uh, well, just check that trace. Let's just see where it goes because I mean it could be something as simple as you know some damage under the uh, you know where we took our sockets off because there was a balked trace up here somewhere wasn't there so 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 it was 22 so let's just uh, test we've got connection on the actual top of the pin we do and uh, let's just go along here and just see if we have a connection somewhere maybe A11 comes from somewhere else oh now look there that is the answer. So we've got one, two, three, four, fourth on this side here. So yeah, we just need a wire um, from uh, that pin on our board to the fourth from right, the CPU there. Let's just double check. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah, it's been 22. So. So trying to understand that chip select issue, you can see we've got a keyboard chip select there coming out of 
U16 which is the PLA. Now this is obviously a brand new device here so I can't imagine the PLA being the cause. This is why I went testing the connectivity around there though on those address lines and A11 was obviously missing. The only other thing I thought was there's two signals that look like outputs here that come around and uh, yeah one of them is used for the clock input on this flip flop one of these flip flops and the other one goes into the uh, one one side of each of these here but I was looking at this and this just does the address this 139 here does the address decoding for all of these signals here so you've got like RAS uh, I can't remember MUX that is basic chip selects and then you've got C1 low C2 low kernel chip select 1 C1 high C2 high I can't see how that could have any bearing on the keyboard stuff at all so even if these connections are not going there I think it just wouldn't boot I think some of these signals here wouldn't be there and likewise if you had a problem with the uh, the MOS currently on my board it's a MOS branded one the LSO2 here it probably wouldn't boot you'd get a black screen or something um, and it's the same thing with a flip flop if the flip flop was balked or the 139 was balked yeah, you'd perhaps see evidence there on the chip selects. You know, this is where you should be checking the chip selects and things in particular. Um, if you have more than one low on the one, you know, two chips, you know, addressed at the same time, maybe the kernel and the basic, for example, that would be a problem because you can see you've got kernel chip select and basic chip select both there. If those were both low, it's going to be either the one three, well, probably the one three nine, but you know, that's where you want to be looking really, the LS twenty, or it's going to be the one seven five flip flop there. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah, it's this one here. So, and we've got sufficient solder there, but that is one of the ones. It's the one next to the one that went to the wire, actually. So, yeah, maybe the solder hasn't flowed through. I mean, I could just test at this point, but you know what? Because it's been a bit flaky there, I think I would just like to, uh, you know, uh, secure that with a uh, wire. So, let's uh, join our kind of into position there and then we just need to root that and it's the fourth one so let's just add a bead of solder once you've got something that sticks out as visible you then uh, won't get mistaken for the wrong pin one two three four nice big blob there that's it and we just need to simply root this wire over to that. There's probably a nearer place I could pick it up, but you know what? I'm not too fussed about having a, a, a wire about that length there, so I'll snip it about there, I think. Push it into position. That should do. So I've got our wire in place. Let's give it another try and see if the keyboard is any healthier. So, Q. Nope. Keyboard doesn't work. Five works, six so on. Yeah, so some of the keys are working there, but not all of them. I wonder if we've got another uh, thing missing. So it's, yeah, it's still balked, so maybe that IC is dead. But A11 wasn't going there. So hmm. I'll continue testing around the PLA. So actually, the uh, chip select is working now with A11 there. If I scope, uh, if I probe that pin, you can see the little peak there in the middle. I had to adjust the time base as default. It was like that. It just looked like a high line. <laughs> you know, it was just high. But zooming in on it, yeah, you can see we are getting the correct chip select now. Now, it's dead obvious now, but the low pulses were so infrequent that they didn't register on this. It's like, you know, predominantly high. It's all about the duty cycle. The duty cycle meant there was like, I don't know, 99.9% .9 that high. <laughs> so then there's not enough time for the uh, green LED to light. So that's why the logic probe is giving me a flashing red. And uh, obviously when the scope, I use the, or press the auto button just to automatically calibrate to the signal I was uh, scoping. And uh, it was, uh, the time base was wrong. So I just saw a straight line. So I was like, how is it, how is it high when this is flashing high? So yeah, it was a really simple thing that. So you may be wondering, why is the keyboard still not working? And consider me uh, schooled. The keyboard, whilst it's got the same connector, I take back what I said earlier, that Commodore were intelligent and went, oh, let's reuse the same keyboard. No, they didn't. They used the same frame and stuff, but the PCB is totally laid out differently. The matrix is different. So, yeah, I don't have a keyboard, so I can't test any further now. And, uh, the, pra uh, and the crazy price is like £30 plus £30 shipping for a C16 keyboard.
so at this particular point we can't really go any further I'll test with the uh, you know the diagnostics ROM again now we've got A11 in place that may change some behavior there somewhere but I mean it was it seemed to be passing the tests didn't it um, yeah but this is the thing that can make these a little bit hard to work on if you've been working on C64s and VIG 20s because you need a keyboard but also but also it's about the port well we'll get the port on there we can do that joystick ports you know they're, they're different completely different so you need to adapt out and obviously the keyboard is different I could adapt from that I may have to take the uh, the keyboard to pieces I'm not sure um, but from what I understand is you can just rewire them you can change the wiring around so in theory I could adapt to that yeah I might be able to do that if I do that then at least we could do further tests on this yeah so I think we'll call that a day for part one uh, in part two we'll pick up uh, with the RAM I think um, we've got a, a Zen diode to fit on here we've got a tape interface the joystick port to put on there uh, I'll build that adapter and um, yeah I think it's going to be probably a two or a three part video this we obviously need to get the tape uh, thing working as well because there's, there's a jumper on here with the 6510 uh, there's two different ways uh, of to, maybe two things you need to do I think you need a custom BIOS maybe to do with the, the tape thing because I think the buttons will work all the time um, but there's also mods you need to do to the board uh, with that pad I think in order to get the tape stuff working a little bit better but we haven't got to that stage so anyway hopefully you found that uh, interesting enough for part one if you'd like to support the channel obviously please uh, see the links down below for things like patreon and coffee you can also click the join button on YouTube now and I also have some merch if you want to buy a t-shirt or mug they're a little bit pricey I'd like to prefer them to be a lot cheaper but that's all that's available to me um, nevertheless all those things just help the channel keep going I couldn't do this channel without the patreon support I'm so grateful for the support I've had over the last two or three years since I you know, lost my full time job back in 2019 um, I wouldn't be able to do this channel without you so very 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 much appreciated can't thank you enough I'll catch you in the next video